The Ukrainian National Liberation Movement never stopped, even when Ukraine was seized by Bolshevik Russia and annexed to the USSR. At different times, Ukrainian patriots in exile were actively working on the restoration of Ukrainian statehood. This obviously went against the Stalinist model of building a communist society. That is the reason that the USSR began decimating its enemies beyond its borders for decades, regardless of the possible consequences. Terrorist acts that were devised in the main offices of the Soviet Special Services were used against the leaders of the Ukrainian National Liberation Movement. In cases when a professional assassin was detained, versions of revenge for personal motives were prepared and they easily passed through the courts of European countries. Political assassinations became an element of state policy in the USSR, since the decision to eliminate their political opponents was made in the highest offices of the Soviet state. The terrorist attacks were carried out by clandestine agents of the Soviet Special Services. The causes of Soviet terrorism lie in its origins and nature. The slogans of world communism on the construction of a universal totalitarian state diverged with the theory and practical implementation of the Ukrainian National Liberation Movement. The leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, came up with a primitive, cynical and extremely effective formula of no person, no problem. This policy became the main element of state terror. The whole history of the Soviet state and the communist empire of Stalin is a history of ongoing political assassinations. Special departments and brigades of professional assassins who left no traces were established. They tried to act in secret, since reprisals against political opponents, a broad and socially significant people, could cast a shadow of doubt on the bright and favorable image of the motherland in the minds of all workers and its leader. The leader of Ukrainian political immigration, chief Ottoman of the UNR, Simon Petlura, who emigrated to France after the defeat of the liberation struggle, was the first to take a bullet of the Soviet special services. The All-Ukrainian Extraordinary Commission, also known as the Ukrainian Cheka, recognized Petlura as the worst enemy of Soviet Ukraine in its 1921 report. The special services were given the task of preventing the realization of Petlura's plan by any means, both within Ukraine and abroad. Joseph Bilsudski, a long-time alive Petlura, came to power in Poland again in the year 1925. At the time, there was a serious threat of the formation of a new Polish-Ukrainian Union that would become a formidable opponent to Moscow. On May 25, 1926, in Paris, when Petlura was walking by a bookstore, Soviet agent Sholom Schwarzbard killed Petlura with seven shots from a revolver and immediately surrendered to the French police. During the arrest, he stated that he had shot a killer of Jews. Petlura was taken to a hospital, where he died without regaining consciousness. The investigation lasted for more than a year and was conducted superficially. At the court trial, a group of lawyers who were found with the help of the Joint State Political Doctorate managed to convince the jury that the assassin had been a long avenger who punished Petlura for allegedly organizing the Jewish pogroms in Ukraine. Schwarzbard's lawyer claimed that 15 relatives of the defendant were killed in the pogroms and this crime was committed by the Ukrainian army in May 1919 in the Odessa Oblast. In truth, at that time the army of the Ukrainian National Republic was in Podilla, which was 200 kilometers from the scene of the crime. Some process, uh, 
The trial proceedings, which lasted basically a year, became testimony to how a number of different forces united against Petlura. It turned into a trial against Petlura rather than against his murderer Schwarzbart. Archival documents indicate and prove that this was a special operation devised by the special services of the Soviet Union. The appropriate funds were allocated and the materials of the trial were collected. In the end, the assassin was acquitted and Petlura's reputation still remained affected by this trial, even though all the facts and documents related to these events proved that Petlura was not in any way implicit organizing those pogroms. The leader of Ukrainian nationalists Yevhen Konovalit was killed on May 23, 1938, in the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Throughout the 1920s, the Soviet secret services repeatedly attempted to assassinate Yevhen Konovalit. In 1937, the realization of the last operation to kill the OUN leader, code named Stavka, began, which was devised in Moscow under the personal supervision of Stalin. The authority of Konovalit was the authority of an immensely experienced person. He was a company sergeant major in the Austrian army, then he was a prisoner and then he conducted major selfless work to form a Ukrainian army. He was a man whose goal was to achieve the independence of Ukraine. Konovalit was a very interesting individual. On the one hand, he built his illegal agent network in Dnieper region, in Soviet Ukraine, in the circumstances of the separation of Ukrainian people. There are documents that directly show that he really had this network among the Red Offices. Secondly, since the second half of the 1930s, this individual gained authority in the Soviet state, in addition to the extensive international relations of the developed anti-Soviet coalition. This eventually became a major problem for the leaders of the Soviet Union. Therefore, it was decided at the highest political level to get rid of Konovalit, who was considered a dangerous enemy of the state. Agent of the Soviet Union Intelligence Service Pavel Sudapladov was the perpetrator of the assassination attempt. He managed to gain Konovalit's trust under the guise of representative of a supposedly friendly illegal group operating in Ukraine. During a meeting in a cafe in the Atlanta Hotel, he gave Konovalit explosives disguised in a box of chocolates with Ukrainian ornaments. It was allegedly a gift from some friends. The box exploded when it was accurately placed in a horizontal position. The lead of the Ukraine Ukrainian liberation movement was buried in the Cross Week Cemetery in Rotterdam. We can say that the assassination of Konovalit was a proactive approach to prevent the strengthening of a certain anti-Soviet community that was formed between various countries, such as the Baltic states, Finland and the second Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth after the First World War. He was the coordinator of these discontented people and he could build contacts and connections on the territory of Soviet Ukraine. Basically, he posed a major threat to the existence of the Soviet state. I think that if he had survived, first of all, there would have been no split in the nationalist movement. Secondly, this movement could have played a more important role during the years of the Second World War. In the second half of the 1950s, the Soviet Special Services began the hunt for the heads of foreign agents of OUN. On October 12, 1957, the body of the leading figure in Ukrainian nationalist emigration, Lev Rabat, was found on the staircase of building No. 8 on Karol Square in Munich. The examination, conducted by medical coroners, did not reveal any signs of a violent death, and they made a diagnosis according to which he in fact had died of heart failure. They hoped that Rabbit's murder would be connected to the confrontation between Stepan Bandera and Lev Rabbit, since the latter had formed his own organization, the Foreign OUN. He rejected the slogan Ukraine for Ukrainians and proclaimed his own slogan Freedom for Everyone, Freedom for the Others. It was essentially a copy of the slogan of the Atlantic Charter, under the banners of which the Allies 
fought against the encroachment of fascism, who was basically the person who proclaimed European nationalism. Obviously, while we may still underestimate the intentions of Lev Rebet, the special services and the communist regime were well aware of his capabilities. At the same time, agents of the Soviet special services did not stop their attempts to abduct or eliminate the leader of Ukrainian nationalists, Stepan Bandera. During 1947-1959, the OUN security service managed to thwart several attempts to kill him in cooperation with the German criminal police. However, on October 15, 1959, foreign radio stations and press reported that the leader and ideologist of the revolutionary struggle for the state independence of Ukraine, the chairman of the leadership of overseas units of the OUN, Stepan Bandera was murdered by an assassin upon order of the higher authorities. They needed to kill Stepan Bandera in such a way that would cause the leaders of the Ukrainian movement to quarrel among themselves, leave them without a banner and split them into different parts of the Ukrainian movement, between which there was a certain tension to fight while blaming each other. That was basically the main objective, because two years after the assassination it was still unknown who committed it and how. The debate continued, although naturally most of the UPA and OUN members abroad were well aware of the details of what exactly had transpired. The assassination of Bandera could have remained an unsolved crime forever, but then something unexpected happened. In August 1961, a KGB agent named Bogdan Stashinsky turned himself in to the West Berlin police and confessed to the murder of Rabbit and Bandera. A special weapon was made in the so-called Special Laboratory No. 12. It still exists today. It is called Laboratory X. It was a spray gun that fired a jet of poison gas from a crushed cyanide capsule. While in Robert's case there were traces of this capsule on his face, the gun was later improved. When Stepan Bandera was assassinated, they had a mesh on the gun so that it would not leave any traces. In October 1962, the West German Federal Court sentenced the then political emigrant Bogdan Stashinsky to eight years in prison for the murder of Rabbit and Bandera. He was charged with two murders. Once again, the situation in both cases was the same. Just as in Petlura's murder, the attorneys claimed that the motive was personal revenge. This time he was allegedly avenging his relatives, who were tortured by the henchmen of Bandera. It was also a brilliant, so to say, cover-up to protect him from a high degree of punishment. It was supposedly a motive that at least deserved a certain understanding on the part of the judges in the trial playing political assassinations off as acts of personal revenge of one individual was an extraordinary trick of the Soviet special services. They prepared perpetrators who had such stories in advance in the event that there would be a court trial. Judges who were not in the know were simply explained those nuisances. These were people who may not have even known where Ukraine was, but they saw the representatives of Bandera's organization killed his relatives, that actually looked quite moving and effectively incited the sympathy of the people for the victim. In the fight against the Ukrainian National Liberation Movement, the Soviet government was not afraid of its armed resistance, as the military forces of the two sides were not comparable. The regime was frightened by the ideological struggle of Ukrainians for their independence. This example could destroy the Soviet doctrine of the equality of the peoples in a common great state. They believed that the longer the Ukrainian national idea existed, the more people would be involved. Therefore, the supporters of this movement had to be eliminated as soon as possible.